Hi. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I just wanted to welcome you to the uh, third annual Doc Doctor of Design conference, uh, Data Across Scales, Reshaping Design. So we have a really exciting day uh, ahead of us. Thanks for joining us. So I'm Joël Bitton, and I'm uh, currently a role in the DDES program. Uh, my research is specifically also about the implication of data in digital fabrication. I am Felix Raspal. I'm a recent graduate, and I work on the intersection between um, design computation and uh, material research. So um, we just wanted to, sorry, I'm just, we just wanted to uh, also mention that we are co-chairing this conference with Jose, who's here and is going to moderate a few panels today, uh, and Osla Martinkaya, who's in uh, Turkey at the moment, and Wendy, um, also she's stuck in Toronto, but she's going to join us today. Um, and uh, we also uh, will hear a little bit uh, more about the DDES program for a, a few minutes from our program director, Martin Berthold, who's here and is going to speak right after us. Uh, but we just wanted to introduce first the day and the topic itself. So as you know, it's about uh, we're going to talk about data today and the, the role and the implication of it in design practices. Uh, we, as you, you know, it's a hot topic. It gathers a lot of excitement and discourses. So we wanted to unpack that a little bit uh, with um, four different panels. So the conference is going to be organized in four panels, and we have two keynote speakers. The first panel is called Data Driven Design, and it explores the role of uh, computation and increased computational capacity and its uh, implications for design practices. The second panel is called Programming the Physical World and looks at the ways in which numbers can produce forms and spaces. The third panel is called Big Data and Urban Design, and it, it looks at the way in which uh, big data is actually changing the way in which cities are uh, thought and run. The, finally, the fourth panel uh, is called big da Open Data and Civic Media, and it will explore issues of uh, citizen citizenship, privacy, and the territorial um, impact of uh, data centers that collect uh, our collective data. We also have two very exciting keynote speakers, Mario Carpo and Edith Ackerman, who will address this topic for, from very different and uh, exciting perspectives. Mario will look at this from the architectural theory, um, and Edith will look at the idea of quantified self and how it impacts our daily life. Now that we have uh, looked at the overall um, conference topic, we would like to uh, give a few remarks about the logistics throughout the day. Yes. Um, and also, before that, we'll just um, uh, thank the people who, are, um, who have helped for this conference. So, of course, the DDES program and the GSD, the Critical Digital Group, uh, the Lab Library, and Arc Daily for its partnership. And also a special th uh, thanks to Swissnext. Uh, who's been sponsoring um, a large portion of the event. Andreas is here, he was talking last night. Thank you again, Andreas. Um, and we, um, just a, a few reminders about today. Uh, we'll ask the audience to come back on time because we want to not run, it's a long day, so we don't want to run over. Each panelist will last 20 minutes, uh, and then we'll have the rest, the remaining of the session time for Q&A. Uh, we'll also have 35 minutes for the keynote presentation and again the rest of the remaining session for Q&A. Uh, and really the Q&A session for us is not like we really look at it as a very informal conversation. We want the audience to join in, to participate, to be really involved um, in the unpacking that we mentioned earlier. Um, and so I think that's about it for the, um, um, for the logistics of today. Um, so yeah, we have a very, very promising day ahead. Uh, we have, if you have questions or you need anything during the day, everyone with a red tag is there for you. Um, so without further ado, we would like to uh, introduce um, our, the director of our program, uh, Martin Bertold, professor of architectural technology at GSD, who's gonna give a few words. Thank you. Wherever. Good day. Good morning. It's really nice to be here. 
and to see you here. And I'd like to take this opportunity to extend a warm and official welcome from the Doctor of Design program to everybody in the room. Uh, as Joel mentioned, every year a group, of, a small group of students in the program uh, gets to propose and then organize a conference. This is both uh, a pleasure and an incredible burden because these things are actually incredibly time consuming. So uh, congratulations for actually getting this uh, done. Uh, so the fact that we can be here today and there's a program, there's speakers, and there's even coffee and cookies, so fantastic. Um, they propose uh, a topic uh, that's a contemporary topic uh, uh, and uh, in the past we've had events focused on computation, critical digital culture, urban metabolism. Today, of course, we look at data across scales and how it connects to design. The Doctor of Design program is geared towards advanced research on matters of design. Our students are studying these issues at many scales, from the material and product scale, to buildings, neighborhoods, uh, to the regional planning scale, and to the global scales of international practice. The preoccupation with such vastly different scales well represents the incredible diversity of pursuits and interests in the GSD and attests to the vitality of design research in an institution geared towards educating architects, landscape architects, urban designers, and planners. The DDIS program is testimony for the fact that design activities are intimately connected to research. This connection of design and research brings up further questions, I think. If we agree that data is at the very core of research, this is maybe debatable, let's say it's true for the majority of approaches, can we conclude that data practices already today pervade design? Data is certainly important and has been so in design activities. But today, we have unprecedented access to data, are empowered and maybe intimidated by ever new ways of analyzing and deploying data. Already, big data analysis can be used to understand and even anticipate future scenarios in a variety of fields, such as healthcare or emergency response. Will we eventually be able to automate data-based design efforts? With the rise of artificial intelligence, and powerful computers combined with the ubiquitous access to data challenge the very notion of design itself, threatening the need for it altogether. Can we imagine a day when we simply analyze data, model it, and extrapolate behaviors and patterns such that they allow us to paraphrase Herbert Simon to transform undesirable into desirable conditions? I'm sure these and other issues will be part of today's discussion along with many other questions. For now, I would simply state an observation from walking through our very own lobby that you all came through this morning with a platform exhibition, which is a kind of uh, a showcase of work done over the last academic year. If this show is an expression of design outcomes within a strongly digital data culture, then I see more than anything an incredible range of tactics, forms, spaces, and material systems that incline me to believe that data has catalyzed and not constrained or eliminated design. If anything, I see greater diversity, greater vitality and engagement, and a newly enhanced imagination, and much less uniformity that one might expect in a more data or evidence-based design setting. Conferences such as today's event are fantastic platforms to discuss these and other issues, explore thus to the complex relationship between data and design. I'd like to again congratulate the organizing data students on choosing this very timely topic. I don't expect that we will find all the answers, but hopefully at least leave with better questions and glimpses of understanding of the issues. Thank you and enjoy.
Hello. So, welcome to the first uh, session of the conference. Um, a few remarks on how it's going to be the um, um, logistics. So it's going to start, and this will carry for the rest of the panels. Uh, it starts with a brief introduction of the topic, and then an introduction of the presenters. The presenters will um, deliver their research. Then we're going to open this to a discussion for, with the audience. I also have to announce that one of the speakers for this panel, Paul Kell, uh, unfortunately he couldn't make it due to a medical condition last minute. So he uh, apologizes for that and uh, we, uh, we hope to have uh, his information to be uh, transmitted to you in the future. So our first panel is called Data Driven Design and it explores how uh, novel design production methods are enabled by the increased processing, um, gathering, and uh, delivery of data. Uh, this in combination to new, with new fabrication technologies. The rapid expansion of data management, storage, and computation capabilities seem to have triggered in recent years a major change in computation, which is now looking at irregular, complex, and messy data and making sense within the noise, elaborating predictions and execution decisions autonomously. Computational paradigms that before were restricted to academic research, such as machine learning or artificial intelligence, are now an integral part of our daily life, such as navigation devices or internet searches. This becomes ubiquitous. Under this ongoing trend, this panel aims to question how these computational capabilities are now opening new ways to conceive and produce physical objects. Our three speakers provide new perspective and evidence of this paradigm shift in computational design. We invite them to share their insights and discuss these issues with the audience during and after their presentations. Our first presentation uh, is by Michael Hans Meyer and Benjamin Dillenberger, and they will show how they are pushing the current limits of data and resolution, elaborating digital process and physical outputs with a maximum level of intricacy, impossible to achieve without current computation and fabrication technologies. Panagiotis Michalato's presentation will re-examine the design practice from the perspective of data, relativizing the fundamental design concept of scale in lieu of the idea of resolution. So now we're going to get started with the first presentation, it's called Mesh Mining, and I will give a very brief introduction of the presenters. <laughs> Michael Hansmeyer is an architect and programmer who explores the use of algorithm and computation to generate architectural forms. His projects include six-order installation of columns at the Wanshu de San Biennale, the design grotesque installation at the FRAC Archilab 2013 exhibition, and the Platonic Solid Series. He recently exhibited work at the Museum of Art and Design in New York, Art Basel, Design Miami, and the Trondheim Kanz Museum. Benjamin Dillenberger is a practicing architect and assistant professor in architecture at the John H. Daniel Faculty of Architecture, Landscape, and Design at the University of Toronto. He previously worked as a senior lecturer at the CAD Group at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. He holds a Master of Advanced Studies degree from ETH Zurich and a Master of Architecture from Technical University Kaiserslautern. Please welcome them to the podium. Take a minute, okay. So um, I'll start while, while the presentation comes up saying um, uh, thank you to Joel and Felix and Jose and Martin um, for the invitation. We're very excited to, to be here today. Um, do you think it would be possible to dim the lights yeah. just a little bit? Uh, thank you so much. And to turn on the sound, how, how many particles can we, can we print today? Is there sound on this one? There should be sound. 
I am plugged in with the HDMI like before. And if I am here on HDMI, that's bad. That's I don't bad. think there's any question about it. I don't it. think there's uh, any question who, about who, who it. Who is? Okay, let me start with that one more time. That's bad. I don't think there's any question about it. Will computers ever be able to work out what Okay, I could go on with this all day. Um, we we can indeed materialize and, and compute almost anything these days. Um, all we need is information, energy, and and raw materials. And it's um, I'm I'm showing here actually a printer um, that um, prints eight. Um, tons of, of sand, and it, 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 you can really specify the, the resolution almost at, the, at, a, at a grain of sand. There are 33 trillion decisions to be made in terms of which grain of sand is either glued together or, or ultimately vacuumed out. Um, the um, interesting thing about this technology is a, a, a box, a plain box, costs no more to print than the most elaborate form conceivable. And you, you truly have mass customization in 3D also. So 100 different boxes or 100 different elaborate forms cost no more than um, a serialized um, production. So with a new technology, is there a new architecture, as, as Ms. Van der Rohe um, claimed was necessary? Um, it is, it's impossible for us to imagine all that we can materialize with this. Um, it is a fabrication technology based on a purely binary logic, and as such, I think it's, I would argue, it's ideally matched for a computational design approach. What, what kind of design approach? I think it has to be a post-parametric uh, post one. Um, we need design instruments to explore these possibilities, and, and they can't be parametric. Um, parametric models, I think, to, to me or to us, are more about um, control of a form rather than exploration. They, they work within a finite prescribed scope um, rather than constructing and building up a solution space. Um, and they're, they're, they're very useful. They're very useful for rationalization, but it's essentially a constraint-based technique. In, in parametric modeling, every rule must be defined explicitly. The, the model itself is established a priori. Um, and as such, this implies a thinking in terms of categories. But, but this technology, if anything, allows, gives us the opportunity to escape categories, existing categories. Um, so to quote Whitehead, I think we have to be systematic, but we have to keep our systems open. Um, can, can or could computation work without rules and, and, and predefined models? We, yes, we believe it can, and we believe the answer, or one answer, lies in, in data. Um, Data has been proven to solve problems without explicit models, but we believe it can also be um, used as an exploration of um, design. Um, and today we'd like to present speculations about an architectural data-driven design. Um, we entitle this process um, mesh mining, and it, it um, relies on, on, a basic op on a basic operation which is performed many, many, many times. Um, on, on the most basic level of operations, there are several feasible approaches. There's addition, subtraction, division, um, uh, sort of scaling, translation, rotation, uh, and so on, just to point out a few. The process we, we use works with um, the division of a surface into smaller surfaces. But I want to stress that I don't think that the basic operation itself is the decisive factor in opening up an opportunity space. Um, the, the only important thing, I think, is that the operation itself is simple enough to remain open-ended and to, to not be um, prescriptive. What, what is perhaps more interesting to us is how we um, orchestrate these operations, how we, how we tie these together without a um, pre-definition. So, so we look at a mesh, 
And the unique, unique thing about a mesh is that no matter what geometry it has, each facet, by, by definition, is, is unique unless they're all lying on top of each other. Um, and we can exploit these differences by instrumentalizing and artic articulating them. I will run you very quickly through, through the process itself. Um, there are four steps. So we, we analyze attributes of a face, of each face. Um, these can be topographical or topological attributes. And these are put into a relationship with the corresponding attributes of all the other um, faces in the mesh or in the neighborhood via a um, statistical distribution, a histogram. So here are some mappings, for instance, of edge length, of curvature of faces, of rotation, and, and so on. And, and we can use this information and we can articulate it. Um, we, we use the tool of a, a histogram to, to put one face in relationship to, to its, its, its larger um, context. Um, that, that, is, that is the first part. That is the analysis part of the project, of the process. The second part is really a, um, a reactive part. And we have um, three possibilities. Either we, we, we divide, and that's what I was showing before, um, faces into smaller faces, and we can let this relationship between the face to the whole mesh determine division ratios. We can extrude um, points out of a plane, or we can expand and contract within a plane. And the link between um, what we analyze and what we actuate, what we do, is simply performed by a, a, a mapping curve. A, this can be a, a simple curve of, a, of, any, of any shape. Um, so, so there's a really a, um, that, that's all there is to it. It's, it's a very, very, very simple process um, with, with, with four steps. And um, usually there's a clear distinction between analyzing data and synthesizing data. In, but this, this process isn't really about extracting, trying to find wisdom inside the data. It's not about a single solution. It's rather, it's, it's recursive. So it's many steps going back and back and forth millions of times. Um, this happens in parallel across all faces of the mesh and um, sequentially. It's, it's adaptive and the mesh essentially um, determines the behavior of the mesh. Everything is interconnected, yet everything has an individual behavior. So a form such as this one can be, can be described actually in um, a simple sentence. And, and yet it can, this simple sentence produces, I don't know, terabytes of data that, that are not um, reducible via, via compression. You can get um, local curvatures, multiple scales, local conditions, um, patterns, and, um, and so on. Um, the question is, so that's, that's the process itself. Which, which I just talked about. That's inside, inside this process. At, at the very basic level of it, there's this, this operation. Um, the interesting question, though, is how can we, as architects or designers, use, use this process? How can we proactively use it? How can we gain control over it? How can we um, forfeit control over it? Um, and this, to a large extent, involves um, search heuristics. That is something that Benjamin is going to talk about right now. Thank you. So, so we have really this uh, tool that creates this enormous uh, space of possibilities, this search space. And now we have to find and we develop some uh, approaches how to navigate as an architect in this search space, how to be able to orient ourselves in such a, a um, space of possibilities, but at the same time also keep, keep it open. So not, not by predefining very explicit search criteria. So one approach is that we start to just breed designs with each other. So we, we, uh, we mutate, we combine designs in order to generate new forms and select visually what form and uh, uh, permutate and permutate over and over. So the architect is more or less more like a curator or a cultivator orchestrator of the design. Like these examples of columns that we, we grow actually from, from this subdivision process. All this always under the premise that we, we want to keep this search space open at the same time, but still being able to, to find, to lead, to guide actually the uh, process in the right directions. Now, besides the breeding of uh, uh, solutions, we also experimented with, uh, with another method, which is really entirely data-based. 
statistical methods. So we looked at computer vision because there was a related problem. Sometimes it's very complicated to explicitly define rules, for example, rules or describe when faces would be similar. Now, there, there was a, a statistical method developed which is able to just, so the computer is just able to learn from specific training phases how to distinguish phases. And he does this by statistical analysis of just um, calculating principal components of each of the phase. So what you see here are not phases, but these are like coordinates, four coordinates of a space of phases, which can easily describe each phase with just a single value. But we found out that this process can also be reversed. So once we have this parameter space uh, of phases, we can also start to generate new phases just by these sliders. So actually the computer developed the parametric model. He learned it from, from the results. So from, from this moment, we also started to test it with designs. So we started to uh, train the computer with, for example, these design chairs, just to find out how the computer could maybe develop out of the uh, combination by generating his own parametric model of the world of chairs in order to create uh, new design examples. So basically what we do is controlling by instrumentalizing a uh, surprise. So the idea is really that still we won't be able to, to uh, achieve something new, to achieve something unexpected. Our next step was to bring this to the architectural scale. These are domes now as an input training uh, example. Architonic artifacts. Is it? <coughs> I think it's frozen. It's working? Yeah. Frozen? I think it's somehow frozen, yeah. Yeah, resolution is still the problem. Yeah? Now we're, but uh, so these are our training uh, examples again produced by subdivision, and now in a slightly lower resolution, we excavated the principal components. We uh, uh, analyzed the principal components of these domes in order to be able to to generate actually a whole family of domes. So this is the example of. Now the computer actually. Calcul extracting a parametric model on its own and then, uh, and then learning and reproducing, synthesizing new forms. So we generated this uh, family of dome structures without a parametric model. So what does uh, this mean for architectural design? Architecture, uh, architects might feel uh, a bit uncomfortable because there was a, somehow a, um, a lack of predictability and control, but we think it's actually gaining control by instrumentalizing um, the unexpected. So now let's look at some possible results of such an approach. The forms that we are creating with these methods are strange but familiar. There's a fusion between form, surface, and structure. There's different scales, different hierarchies emerging from the design process. There's somehow this in-between between, between the man-made and the natural. Or bes between the expected and the surprise. I'd like to end with this now going back to the materialization. So what you see here is basically the purely materialized data directly from, from the uh, process to, to the um, materialization of, of the form itself. This is now not the mesh mining, but we are mining now for the form itself out of this uh, box of uh, sandbox of possibilities.
So I'd like to end with the, um, a quote from Cedric Bryce. He said, uh, uh, technology might be the answer, but what is the question? But we believe that technology can also be an instrument of exploration, what helps us ultimately to ask the right questions. Thank you. So our next presenter is uh, Panagiotis Michelatos, and his presentation is entitled The Environment as Signal. Um, Panagiotis Michelatos is an architect and assistant professor in architecture at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Between 2006 and 2010, he worked as a computational research design researcher for the London-based structural engineering firm AKT. While in AKT, along with colleagues Sawako Kaijima, they provided consultancy and designed computational solutions for a range of high-profile projects. They have also developed a range of software applications for the intuitive and creative use of structural engineering methods in design. Panagiotis' works in interaction design and media has resulted in a long-lasting collaboration with the Stockholm-based contemporary dance company CCAP. Please welcome Panagiotis to the stage. I'll need the, the sweets to my laptop. Oh, I need to change the resolution for a moment. This is taking a second. <coughs> okay, that's great. Okay, great. Sorry about that. So thank you for coming here today, and thank you for organizing this uh, conference. So today I'm going to try to trace the emergence of different notions of scale from the application of digital technologies during the design process. Uh, the, I'm going to use examples that uh, range from interaction design to structural analysis up to uh, digital fabrication. The increasing uh, ubiquity 
of digital media leads to the adoption of homogeneous models of representation and equivalent methods across different disciplines, including architecture, which has always relied on representations and abstractions during design development. The notion of scale has been central in these modes of representation and is usually understood to mean a ratio of lengths or a correspondence, but also a relation to a reference size, for instance, the whole idea of a human scale. For digital media, however, this concept of scale is in question. The underlying digital representations, the data structures that describe material artifacts, have no inherent scale. Their numerical values may possess a correspondence to a physical size, a unit, a metric, but this is not essential to the representation itself and is often just metadata. With uh, digital processes, disparate types of objects become commensurate. No matter how irrelevant they seem, digital signals spanning different scales are interchangeable. There may be good reasons to affect the design by the data from an, er from an energy simulation or structural analysis, but also any other absurd, whimsical, or seemingly irrational mapping between signals is equally plausible. In addition, the interfaces through which we access and intuitively manipulate such digital models are often devoid of any suggestions over scale. Since the same orthographic and perspective projection is applied at all magnification levels without any reference size, such interfaces almost imply that one should ignore questions of scale, at least as they were understood in the past, and use the exact same formal operations on things as radically different as a chair and a landscape. Arguably, many outcomes of digital and computational design do seem scaleless at first. The human scale, uh, implying the existence of an absolute reference size for architectural space embedded in the standardization of the components of the built environment itself, is, rep is replaced by scalar ambiguity, which can be partly attributed to the integration of digital processes into architectural design. However, the scalar ambiguity is not necessarily a problem. Digital media carry new notions of scale with them that might be conceptually interesting as well as useful in practice. As software design tools move further away from the assembly paradigm inherited from the Industrial Revolution and an approach to design based on geometric constructions, to a paradigm influenced by the biomedical field dominated by continuous distributions across scales with often fuzzy boundaries, the domain of information theory and its application in signal analysis increasingly determines the modes of representation and manipulation of digital models. Within this regime, the closest we can get to a notion of scale has nothing to do with size and ratios, but with information density. It is the entropy that determines size. We can move to a larger scale by filtering out information, by ignoring detail, texture, and variation. But what is considered texture depends on the scale space at which we are looking at the signal. Scale is the sampling of a digital representation at a specific resolution. Digital, digitization, by definition, discretizes space, time, and actions at various resolutions. In a sense, resolution is a more fundamental notion than scale. As modes of representation can acquire autonomy and often affect thought and design process, we should expect new concepts of scale to emerge in order to deal with ambiguities inherent in digital environments. The notion of human scale has been a recurring theme in architecture theory. Whether the human part refers to an ideal, an average, or a maximum, it becomes the absolute reference measure, a metric around, with, around which space is built. Through digital media and in light of big data and influenced by social transformations, economic and political factors, human scale is redefined as a more complex statistical ensemble. Big data is the domain of the statistician, and the environment is a signal to be analyzed. Traditional statistical understanding of the average user, average woman, become multidimensional complex mathematical models, which try to capture both the ordinary and the exceptional. We use statistical tools in order to inspect such models at different levels of details. <coughs> 
The contemporary modular is a fuzzy superposition which may possess a definite mean value and a multitude of variations synchronically. This fuzzy stochastic object can become a design input in a precise way. Human scale relative to whom? A superposition is not a mean, the ideal human of industrial standardization, and is not a bug of diverse singularities either. It is an object that is both of these things and much more simultaneously. It contains all the people at all stages of their lives under all circumstances. It is the myriad ways in which the content of a database can be dissected and interrogated, extracting statistical measures and probability distributions. The relative recent fields of user experience design and human factors are using their own abstractions to describe people and how they relate and inhabit their environment. Perhaps it is a futile attempt to capture human complexity by statistical techniques. Human scale is absorbed into a user model. One aspect of big data is the proliferation of image repositories, even of the most trivial aspects of everyday life. They can elucidate the visual perception of scale mediated by digital acquisition devices and image processing. Image databases offer information regarding the visual appropriation of the environment in unprecedented detail. The collective visual field becomes an object of study, a quantitative alter ego of what the philosopher Zach Rancher calls the distribution of the sensible. The techniques of image analysis and computer vision may point us towards interesting directions on how to deal with the visual perception of scale in a world saturated by digital images. They offer some alternatives to concepts that we traditionally encounter in art and architecture theory regarding visual appropriation of artifacts. Images as signals are analyzed in ways that disregard any symbolic meaning. Digital processing cannot answer questions of meaning, since each image is an autonomous signal, but it can measure the information content, content in a precise way, like this example where we are visualizing the entropy at different locations around this image. One of the most intriguing concepts in image analysis is the idea of scale spaces. This is simply the fact that an image seen as a signal can be filtered in order to isolate different frequencies. As mentioned before, scale is related to information density rather than size. Notions from aesthetics, visual noise, and visual complexity can be precisely quantified. Simple techniques such as image entropy analysis give a quantification of the variable complexity in the visual field. The distinction between figure and ground is perhaps better captured by the dipole of structure and texture. What is structure and what is texture, though, is scale dependent. The notion of scale in digital signals is closely related to that of frequency, which allows a direct translation between spatial and temporal signals. Looking at images and even space itself through the techniques of spectral analysis and the composition of the visual field is possible, and perhaps a theory of, this, of aesthetics that can better cope with the artistic and design products of highly digitized culture. A signal analytical approach to space can lead to an understanding that phenomena could coexist by occupying the same room at the same time and yet different scale spaces. In this uh, stage design project that was first premiered at Venice Dance Biennale in 2010 with uh, choreographer Cristina Caprioli, we were trying to go away from the idea of immersion or of stage as a set and create a high frequency dense spatial configuration. So in a sense we are treating space as texture, as occupying frequencies that are beyond the bodily extension of the dancers. We also treat light itself as visual texture. So the role of light is not to create images, but to create moving texture in space. So in a sense, uh, we, treat the space as a we treat the stage as a spatial texture and the light as visual texture, occupying the high spatial temporal frequencies, which although cohabiting, cohabiting with the bodies of the dancer, they yet are distinct because they represent different peaks in the, different peaks in the spectrum of space. 
This also comes from an understanding of uh, using the performance space under a principle of separation of elements that uh, different interventions, they maintain certain autonomy. And this is the same installation at MoMA PS1 a few months ago, which is used for a conference. If a world captured and dissected through digital processes brings new notions of scale, gaming environments and digital representation techniques bring new experiences of scale. They make the very small or the very large and even the undefined directly accessible. This is from an exercise we do with students uh, trying to create an active viewer. So the act of viewing changes the environment and also question perception of scale through digital representations. When way, one way we experience scale through vision is in our innate capacity to assume a point of view when looking at the perspective representation with digital media in the past 30 years or so, the perspective of an ideal pinhole camera has dominated the whole way we view any type of digital information. Lev Manovich argued in the 90s that the camera has become a generalized metaphor for viewing any type of information on a digital display. A cinematic vocabulary of operations, span, zoom, rotate, has become the default mode of experience all sorts of digital information. Especially when it comes to architectural models, one type of projection, a pinhole perspective, because of its numerical simplicity, became the de facto lens through which we perceive proportions and space. However, with new hardware and uh, with new techniques in computer graphics, this di digital lens has become programmable. One can easily cust customize the project transformations to achieve different levels of realism or expressionist effects. And you can have variable scale transformations within the visual field. Another way, and this is a project by Jose who is here, to embed some information about scale in an interactive environment, in a digital design environment, is to actually limit the way the viewer can move in this environment. So you don't limit the amount of actions, but you're moving the way of movement. So in this very uh, basic landscape sculpting interface, the user is only allowed to move within the landscape at the rate equivalent to walking or running. That, in a sense, has the... Um, effect that the user always assumes a subjective position relative to the model and tries to distinguish between near field and far field operations rather than looking at the whole landscape as an object to manipulate. And the game industry too and game designers are producing new experiences of scale from the sparseness and ambiguity of antechamber to the hypermodularity of Minecraft. Scale in digital media is an operation and a fine transformation applied to a data set. And this generalization can manifest on physical artifacts questioning our sensory expectations. In this sculpture, a simple gesture and non-uniform scaling applied to an otherwise realistic model greatly distorts our perception of space. So the, the image is not squeezed, the actual sculpture is squeezed here. Although I don't know whether a computer was involved in the design of this sculpture, it is doubtful whether this transformation, this exact expression, would have been meaningful or conceived in a pre-digital era. And in that sense, even geometry itself is becoming a signal. The approach to geometry itself has been changing in light of developments in computer graphics. The Euclidean construction of the pre-digital era and the Riemannian geometry of the past 20 years gives way to techniques that describe geometric objects as superpositions of space, of shapes of different frequencies. The idea of scale spaces we saw applied in image analysis, it now applies to three-dimensional objects equally well. Such techniques can enable the fast and, uh, and deformation invariant characterization, consistent segmentation, compression, and embedding of information directly into the geometric form of an object. We can transfer the detail from one object, the high frequency scale space, to the structure of another object, the low frequency uh, scale space. In 
Uh, this research we call Eigenshell is also an application of this approach to form synthesis, to synthesizing structural forms for structural optimization using this superposition of fundamental shapes as a way to produce new forms. In this way, the designer can control the frequency and the visual noise within the outcome by cutting off certain frequencies from the space of possible design outcomes. In one sense, some notion of scale as a ratio mapping between the digital model and the physical reality does appear within digital design workflows. When we use simulations, it is often necessary to fix this ratio, to adopt a unit system. After all, material effects are size dependent. Physical objects cannot scale up and down in the same way as, it, as idealized geometric models do. Simply because the strength of a material is a constant, but mass increases by the cubic power of length changes. That much was explicitly stated by Galileo in his writings on mechanics of material. In structural engineering, there are precise methods that enable us to jump between different scales without increasing the complexity of models. They are called homogenization and localization. And arguably, one of the trajectories of technology is the ever final control over matter, reducing the entropy of the material across all scales. In biology, too, we see the production of hierarchical materials that display entropy, reduced entropy and organization and structure at different scales. Additive manufacturing is emerging, is emerging as the ultimate multiscalar construction method. At least it promises to be. Especially with multi-material 3D printing, the design of hierarchical materials becomes a design opportunity. Distribution of material properties by the precise deposition of materials without, with various optical, mechanical, thermal, and electrical characteristics at ever finer resolution enables a type of hierarchical material design spanning a scale continuum from the micro to the macro. So in a sense, we are looking now in order to make this kind of uh, opportunities intuitively accessible to designers to develop new interfaces that go beyond the assembly paradigm, the boundary representation that dominates the current generation of design tools, and to tools more inspired by the biomedical field. Tools that will allow, allow us to describe this type of fuzzy objects that have continuous distributions of material at different scales. So I will end up with the project, research and development project I've been working with Andrew Payne for the past one and a half years, which is basically a voxel-based modeling software that was trying to answer the question of how we can create design workflows that allows us to organize matter at different levels uh, concurrently. So basically, these are just the type of operations that one can do to build up geometry. Although this looks like a surface model, it's actually a volumetric model, it's actually a fuzzy model. It has an extending space that is defined as a field. And you can define different densities and material distributions that vary from point to point in space. You can do highly uh, non-linear deformations and topologically unstable modifications in the geometry, and you can also work both in the micro scale and the macroscopic scale of the object. Uh, 
The important thing is that when you start using this mode of representation, which is not a mesh-based representation of geometry, it's a more space, dense, spatial, continuum mode of representation, you can start using signal analysis techniques and techniques borrowed from image analysis, like filtering techniques, noise reduction, uh, very uh, radical topological deformations. And you can also start looking at the problem of creating this type of hierarchical material assemblies, working both in the macroscopic and the mesoscopic scale, using three-dimensional typographic techniques, like three-dimensional half-toning. We can create our custom material distributions, our custom mixing modes of materials in the micro, micro scale. So if you can mix, for example, a transparent and an opaque material, you get this sort of effect. So the way the designer, the micro pattern, the microstructure of the material, this level of matter organization is opened up as a design problem. And we can start talking about anisotropic materials, materials that are optically anisotropic, so things that look opaque from one side and transparent from another, things that transmit uh, light in particular ways, objects that uh, have particular responses to light or to deformation and elasticity. So we can micromanage the grain of material and the way materials bend under strain. And we can also uh, very easily combine this sort of techniques, this underlying representation with analytical techniques uh, that allow almost real-time feedback to the designer in terms of uh, the properties and the behavior of the system that she is uh, developing. We can directly materialize this continuous material distributions and we can create micro patterns, micro reinforcement patterns, so we can have a very high level of control across many different scales. So what they were trying to argue is that uh, new notions of scales are necessary in order to make sense of digitally conceived and produced artifacts. And the techniques that we are using and the underlying representations of data they're not just useful, but also a fertile conceptual ground for us. Thank you. So thank you very much for these wonderful presentations. I think we have a very great impression on what uh, what this uh, debate is a good starting point for this debate. And we've seen, I think, from your presentations uh, and your your work, how um, we're witnessing a, a, a trend that goes from what we we know as parametric design and this. Uh, uh, overused concept into uh, new ways of uh, computing that uh, are under the umbrella of big data. And one of the main differences uh, that you all point out is the difference between uh, a model that is highly deterministic to notions that come from statistical analysis. And in both presentations, we've seen how image recognition and Im image analysis are one of the uh, kind of ready available tools and how designers, and either in the design school or as a design experiments, they, they take uh, these uh, instruments and these uh, procedures and try to deploy them as uh, um, design methods. 
one interesting thing that I, I, I recognize on the presentations and in your work is that some of this um, um, superposition of information comes from either intrinsic information, especially in, in Michael's and Benjamin's work, is a, a constant uh, understanding and rereading of the same object itself, and it's, a, it's same information is generated by manipulating the same object. And in some of the projects that uh, Pan was uh, showing, the information comes from outside. But in, in all the cases, this information is, uh, is not uh, highly precise, but it's fuzzy, and the procedures tend to make sense or uh, generate patterns uh, among these. One of the questions, and I think maybe just to start the discussion, and, and the idea is to open this to the audience and uh, have a conversation all together. Uh, one of the, the first questions is uh, how do we actually um, negotiate between this idea that an object in, in, in the realm of big data is not really an object but a space, and there are um, different solutions. It, it contains multiple informations in one single model. And suggested a little bit on the last project by Pan, this could be in a multi-material approach uh, in which a model actually has densities and this uh, blurriness is actually embedded physically in an object which has different degrees of uh, consistency. Another approach that I think uh, was evident on, on, on Benjamin and Michael's projects is the idea of catalog, capturing a range of these uh, elements and crystallizing them, making them fixed. Um, but I mean, the question, or I mean, the, the starting point of the debate is how you negotiate between this idea of uh, information that is blurry and solutions that are not fixed and the kind of necessity in a certain way of designers to actually materialize one or a discrete number of, of objects. I think one way to, to look at it is not that uh, by necessity, probably you will have to freeze or choose a solution at some point, or a solution will emerge out of different factors of a selection process. But the culture as a whole will produce a lot of artifacts that cover a large space of solutions. So if we are looking at individual produ production, yes, it appears as a singular artifact that emerges, but if we are looking at collective production of culture, then there is a, this kind of fuzziness exists. I think the idea of uh, architecture as the discipline that realizes ideal forms is kind of a, is obsolete at the moment. So it's uh, actually now we are looking at what architecture actually and design does, which has always been treating this kind of stochastic models and stochastic processes, it has always been open to an extent. Yeah, I, I, I would I would I would second that. I mean, I think this um, these these approaches they favor multiplicities. They favor n not 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 a single um, solution. And and the question really is how we we, we can deal and combine with um, the, these these multiplicities, perhaps to arrive at a, at a single solution. I think that the question of search is 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 really becoming the the almost the most important one, or, or the question of, of navigation within, within a, in a solution space. Um, because the beauty of, of some of these processes is that they are so, so open-ended and so um, non-prescriptive um, that, that, that it's really about finding, finding one's way. Um, yeah. Add to this that I, th I think it's, it's the digital world and shouldn't maybe seen anymore as an isolated object, but they are, they are actually all connected. We have access to many designs, but also when we start to create a digital model, there's all the possibilities are there already at the moment when we instantiate this model. But the principal question is really how to select and how to, how to uh, search, how to exclude actually, uh, rather than how to generate. Um, maybe a second question and then open. Um, Pan introduced the idea of scale, and I mean, in order to relativize this idea of scale and uh, suggest that in the world of uh, data, um, scale is not the most relevant um, aspect or concept. And I, I think we, we all agree on, on that idea. But again, a little bit back to uh, the work of, of uh, Michael and Benjamin. In a certain point, the uh, 
the level of resolution and the level of um, um, <coughs> physicality in the, in the physical production becomes um, very important. So I, th I think the question mo mostly is going to be for, for you, Michael and Benjamin. So I, I think you probably deal with this idea of uh, scalelessness, but uh, how do you n n go from um, a space of search to the decision of uh, what specific scale is going to happen and wh how does that process happen? How does the, the, the object that actually is in the digital domain uh, becomes, uh, appears this uh, ratio? Of a, within a physical reality that comes from from physical space. Well, I I think there's not so much a, it's not so much a scalelessness as the idea that we've reached a scale that 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 is almost at the the, the threshold of our perception. I mean, to the point that we cannot distinguish anymore visually or haptically. Um, and what Pan was mentioning, is, and this is this is um, accentuated by the, um, the possibility of multi-material. Um, Printing or materialization, in in terms of it, to, to us, it's 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 that that is this multiscalarity is is one of the biggest potentials for for architecture, coming coming from modernism where which celebrated the smooth surface that that um, that was perhaps a product of this um, uh, mass um, fabrication, the assembly line, and so on. We we now have the the possibility to create surfaces surfaces again or form. Not just a surface that has a depth that has um, that reveals more information. The closer you get to it, that um, that um, perhaps makes you curious to to to, to touch it. Um, we didn't show. A, we produced the first column actually, and one of the things that intrigued us um, the most about it is it was made out of many 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 facets. We said, please do not touch. But everybody touched it and because they wanted to somehow somehow explore it. And um, ultimately, this, this, this made us very, very, very happy. So this, the possibility of a multiscalarity, the possibility to um, engage an architecture that perhaps communicates more or engages more, um, that, that one wants to discover or explore. Um, and this, this very much feeds into the notion of this um, mass customization, that, that you don't need to have a pattern repeat itself, but that, that you can have very local conditions. I think this, this, uh, multi, this multi-scalar this also relates to these local conditions. These are interesting points for us. Yeah, I think it's also uh, maybe, a, I think it's a very good point in discussing about digital uh, design tools and digital design, because, because like that would be one critique of also existing strategies where one can really not distinguish anymore between the, the, the furniture and the opera house in terms of scale. Trying to avoid uh, somehow to, to have, I think it's not possible to apply the same procedures on different scales. So there there must be different uh, different structures appearing. But but nonetheless, one one process can produce multiple yeah. scales. Yeah, and, and so in, in terms of how does one design with it, I don't know how you you deal with it. We we actually sometimes have as we're designing it, the the modular man standing next to our digital model, or the picture of a hand, or of a fingernail, or something, just so that we. We can kind of because because of the scalelessness in, in the in the three D space that you alluded to. Well, maybe it's a good time to open the discussion. I don't know if you have some internal questions you want to ask to each other, or we just go to the audience. Yeah. Wait for the microphone. Thank you. Uh, I have a question to, to Benjamin. I mean, uh, you briefly showed um, uh, that you performed some uh, co principal component analysis on, on the furniture, on the, on the ch chairs, right? So this is something which like people do with, with faces, and especially like if you go you use like deep learning techniques, you have various abstraction levels. And on those levels, when you perform principal component analysis, you can assign those features to, let's say, certain f facial features or emotional features. So I'm just curious, if, if you perform such a thing on the chairs, then you should be able to extract some features and give it some meaning to, to, to those features. Uh, have you a look at that and, or, and what it would be? 
Uh, I think it's a, it's a difficult uh, challenge to to find meaning in 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 just the analyze of. Uh, so, I mean, one, one thing is that these uh, automated uh, principle component analyze what we might do as a human also in a certain way often to, to find like the principal characteristics of something. But uh, if the computer said, I'm, I'm not sure, like the meaning would maybe uh, can only be produced by, by a cultural embedment in, in, um, in relation to other humans. I'm not, so, but, but I, I think the idea behind applying such a technology is also to not start from an, for, uh, that that uh, these components don't have to be uh, explicitly defined, but can uh, it's another maybe more intuitive approach to com to computational design that one can just by maybe feeding computers with examples with training can produce different outcomes and um, without like the uh, explicitly defining if then rules or something. The features, I mean, like if, if we look at the principal component itself from a design object, they, they, are, they have to be rendered into another object in order to create. I add something here, but if you do principal component analysis using a voxelized version of chairs, then what you're getting is the principal components of the mass distribution, basically, of the object. But maybe from a subjective perspective or an aesthetic judgment on the object, Things like uh, amount of detail or amount of uh, or topological differences might be more important and have a bigger impact in terms of stylistic uh, appreciation of the object. Thereby, the meaning we attach yeah. to it. Other questions, Jose? Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your contributions this morning here. Um, I would like to go back to some early words that you made in your presentation, Michael, where you tried to offer your view on what parametric is right now in the contemporary design practice, right? Which I think is a really nice effort since I have the perception that parametric is becoming this wild card, this wild card word for anything that resembles complexity, uh, geometry, or anything. So I, um, you suggested that your view of parametrics is bringing up a framework where initial parameters have been strictly offered by the designer. And you also offered this post-parametric view where you said that um, you felt that um, parametrics were not enough because they were like, they offered too much of anticipation of not surprise to that designer, right? Offering this alternative of like exploration and rule-based generation of geometry, right? Um, maybe what I would like to say here is like offer a provocation and um, and think about how in my pers my personal experience, like I've had many people learning parametric design, many students um, trying to get into these fields, and even though strict parametric design may seem very anticipatory, think people design their parameters and they come up with solutions that they kind of expected. I've seen many times people be surprised and be amazed and actually explore the limits of the parameters they implemented and then be surprised by the, their own outcomes that they did not expect. So I wonder if that separation between, let's say, rule-based ba rule generation of geometry and like um, parametric design and the exploration and the role of the curator, as you mentioned before, is not such a strong boundary, but it's more like a blurry, it's like a gradient between something that may seem more anticipatory, but just because our mind is like, it's, it takes much harder effort to imagine what the outcome of a rule-based system might offer. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. It's definitely not a black and white distinction. It's And, and there's many, many different definitions um, that, that have been offered and, and that point to different um, directions. I, it's something I struggle with also to, to, to make this distinction. I think one on one level, I think it's the difference between um, controlling parameters of an object or controlling um, or using parameters for an operation. Um, and in this case, this operation was extrusion or was, was division or something. So it's perhaps it's the distinction is not only between data and a data-driven approach and a parametric one, but between a procedural and a parametric one. Um, it is, I do think that often parametric models as such um, have a, a, a model or a, a, a constraints based a priori. 
Um, I, I don't think there is the same amount of, of open-endedness that you can get from, from a purely op operations-based approach. And with this open-endedness comes a, um, the, the possibility of what you were saying, the unexpected. So processes that are deterministic, but because there are so many steps, they're not necessarily um, predictable. But I, I, Benny, what, what do you have to say? I think it's, you're, you're absolutely right. It's not black and white, and you can, you can get surprise within a parametric space. I think the param purely parametric model is also um, cate more categorical. You, you, one way to explore the space would be through categories. Um, and, and that's precisely something one struggles with with um, this, this purely data-driven one. We don't have the categories. That's, um, we don't have ways of, of, of classifying, of, of reducing, of breaking down. And, and that is why, why search becomes, becomes so important. Or these ways, such as these eigenfaces, to, as, as a means of, of trying to navigate or make sense of the space. I, I would add something. I think one, one main difference, I think, um, or one thing that big data is adding to this um, 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 parametric modeling is that before, I mean, the conventional parametric models, they can produce an, an incredible uh, out, outcome, a level of uh, variations of outcome. But what, I mean, pattern recognition and um, image um, analysis, what it's bringing is the, bringing, I mean, before the, the designer is um, supervising everything and is one the one making sense and um, selecting, curating. I think pattern recognition, I mean, from, from the, the search, um, experiments that, that um, Benjamin was showing. The computer itself is starting to make sense by itself of the differences. Uh, w the question that, that was, was raised is, can we actually train the computer to actually generate those categories? And those categories could be, they are external. They are not inside of the, pro the, the, pro the field of projects, but they, they are divided into, um, uh, they, can, they can relate to, let's say, real life or external um, information. I think, Martin, one question. Two very beautiful presentations. Thank you very much. Um, since I've seen Panos work a little bit more, I thought we I'd take this chance to to, to um, like engage Michael and Benjamin's a little bit more. I was in Vienna recently and saw one of the buildings by Adolf Loos. You know where this is headed now, right? Uh, we all know what he said about ornament. Uh, and I'm not implying anything, uh, but let me just position it, okay, and, and, and ask you whether you are interested or have thought of your work in the context of ornamentation, right? There's been an interest, a kind of new interest in ornament, uh, digital ornament in some sort, on many levels, in, let's say in the past 10 years. Um, and um, I think it connects to the question of scale. Because, uh, and you mentioned sort of the, the, the issue of human perception and the sort of resolution and appreciation of the incredibly intricate systems that you are producing, right? So at some point or other, would this work, could this work be considered ornamental and how would you feel about that? Uh, and at what, at what scale would it stop being ornamental if you feel it could be ornamental, uh, scaling up or scaling down? Because I could imagine these objects, which are incredibly beautiful, at the scale of a necklace, right? Kind of something you hang here, and it's tiny and it's unbelievable. What you showed, the sort of extra, the sort of excavation, which reminded me of archaeological artifacts, right? Um, that's the scale that you chose to produce them, and it may have to do with the means of fabrication that are at your disposal, right? Uh, would you choose to do this at a building scale? Uh, and would it then stop being ornamental, or would it still have an ornamental effect? So, I'm ruminating. But yeah, the, yeah. The, the what, what are your thoughts? The ornamental question is a is an interesting one. I mean, of course, um, ornament ornament and, and is a crime. Ornament and crime um, was also um, provoked. Well, I think it was also term self-marketing for him. But besides that, it was this, the social connotations of ornament, right? It was always the, 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 the struggling person, the lower class building it for the upper class, the slave for the king, and, and, and so on. Um, and, and this was one of the critiques of it. Right now, you have this, this printer producing this space that you pay per bounding box. So the 
smooth surface costs just as much as the most arti articulate one uh, you, you can imagine. So there are no, the, the cost is the same, the time is the same. So these social connotations that have existed for, yeah, forever, are, have suddenly been erased. So we can, we, can, um, we can decide we prefer the smooth surface still, or we prefer the non-articulated, non-ornamental non one, or, or we can decide we, we don't, um, but it, it becomes a purely aesthetic decision, at, I think, at this point, to the, the point that we're not talking about function yet, um, and is no longer one related to um, societal pressures or, kind of, um, or means of distribution and, and, and so on. It's a, it's a post-scarcity kind of, kind of thing. In terms of scale, um, Yes, you're right. It, it, it works at an, any scale. I think we the, the process works at multiple scales. One one of the things that I take what, that I find interesting, and I mentioned it just before, is that it works at multiple scales, but it doesn't produce the same thing at every scale. So potentially, it can create objects that are um, Benjamin mentioned the chair that could also be an opera house. Um, we could hopefully create something with, with specific scales. In, in terms of ornament, um, when, when does something become ornamental, when, when doesn't? I think, um, well, for one thing, these, these um, processes can create something that is not only surface, but is really a fusion of structure and, and, and surface. So the, the question is, is something structural still ornamental? By some definitions, yes. Others see it more as something that applied to a surface. But beyond that, it can produce space. It can produce um, enveloping and closing spaces um, that, that you can walk through. So there is definitely the possibility of an ornament. And, and, and that's something that we do explore and find interesting in. But um, I, I don't think it's limited to that. I think uh, with Adolf Loss, uh, we have to take into account that he worked in a period where the economy of resources and the economy of expression were in sync. And we tend to move to a, a production or fabrication paradigm where these two are not necessarily the same. Not, we are not yet there, still producing more intricate forms require more resources, more energy. Even computation is a finite resource. So we're not yet there, but actually these two are less in sync than they were back then. We're getting close, closer, no? I mean, there's almost an equivalency between the, the little particle in the computer, whether it's a surface or a voxel, and, and hopefully the particle that gets printed. But, but no, it's still a little bit away. Can I? Oh. Go ahead. This reminds me of a conversation we had in this very room only a few months ago. I think it was October or November, and there was indeed, there were two pictures on the screen. One was a cover of the book by Adolf Loss, and another was a work by the two of you. <laughs> <laughs> and the topic was indeed quite simple. The economy of ornament changes dramatically between subtractive technologies and additive fabrication technologies. In subtractive technologies, ornament is work, additional work and labor and cost you must put in. In additive fabrication technologies, every voxel must be printed anyway. So that you print it identical to the one which is next or different, it costs the same, just as you have already said. And this is a major watershed in the history of the way we make things, because it was never that way in the past. So it is simple that the economy of ornament as addition, as costly and possibly superfluous addition, does not apply anymore. And this is what we were saying. There was an eminent panel around this table. When someone from the room started screaming like crazy, and we didn't call the police, but the discussion was basically interrupted because it was becoming violent. What did he say? Or but we say? were, of course, wrong. <laughs> Which, of course, is always as a as good argument as any. Um, so I've, perhaps it's still a dangerous subject, and let's postpone it until. <laughs> but this was not the question I had in mind. I had a question for Panagiotis. I was intrigued by something you said when you made reference to Lev Manovich, and you seem to endorse Lev Manovich's contention that the perspectival monocular paradigm is still dominant in the domain of digital representations which is probably true if you're studying the immersive environment of video gaming. But it seems to me that what you have yourself shown 
of your own work. This proves this man of this assumption quite dramatically. Most of the stuff you have shown is conceived and modeled in 3D from the start. It is true, we still communicate it using images, and some of the images may be perspectival renderings. It is true that images that go into our eyes have the retinal you know, structure of a monocular um, center perspective. So images we use as interfaces to have access to a 3D model may occasionally still be perspectival. But when that happens, it is accidental, because what matters for us today is the 3D model, which is our main tool for design, fabrication, for the recording and the transmission of spatial ideas. So where do you stand on Velev Manovich? Do you still think as he does? And then you do the opposite of what he claims. Okay. No, uh, I think um, I agree that the model is, uh, let's say, the object that we are interested in, but the way we are uh, interacting with the model, the way we manipulate the model, happens through particular representations. I think we still in this monocular perspectival regime, simply because uh, for technical reasons, if you look at, uh, for example, hardware acceleration in the past 30 years, the whole idea of a projection matrix that facilitates this transformation, this perspectival transformation, has been very consistent. So it's the exact same type of perspectival transformation applied throughout all the video games, the design interfaces, even the ones I was using. And the, my critique there was that uh, this, of course, is not uh, the same as uh, human vision that has all the saccadic jumps and all these other characteristics. Uh, it's also very distorting in terms of perception of scale and perception of uh, proportions. But it, we have been almost addicted to it because it has been so ubiquitous and we don't question. But right now we are also, it's not only customization at the level of material, but at the level of software with the new shader technologies and so on. This opens up again as a question of what is the proper projection for different scales, for different objects, for different experiences. Yes, monocular perspective has been with us for 500 years, but it was invented at a given point in time. What did we do before that? Yet we existed as a race, we did stuff, so we can do it without monocular central perspective, which, by the way, is right if we look with only one eye, but we have two, and stereoscopy was discovered only in 1836. So even the domination of a monocular perspective is determining space and time. And it is a technological, a cultural technology, which was invented at a point in time, and which was probably superseded at a later point in time. And by the way, all the images you have yourself, yourself shown do not have central, you did not use central projection. The stuff you have shown was in parallel projections. A lot of stuff that had central projections. Actually. Almost Most parallel. of it are using all <laughs> the same transformation, because I'm bound to the hardware. We have other questions? Ooh, is this on? Hi. I would say it's, it's really fun to see this. I think because what people are talking about ornamentation, but as I see it, I think of also sort of this new tactile things you can experiment with. And I'm curious if there's starting to be sort of tactile tools that you could use to imagine surfaces like this. Because it seems like we have really good visual tools now, but if you're sitting there at the computer, you could sort of get a sense of what this new sort of really detailed thing will look like, but you don't have the real-time feedback to, to touch it, which seems like is sort of an important part of the experience of the thing that actually comes out of it. I think that's a fantastic uh, idea, actually. Uh, one could see maybe the 3D printing is just a very slow 3D display, but it would be fantastic to have like a, a, a very fast one. That's a really, uh, it's an important aspect, I think, as Michael... Uh, like when people start to touch surfaces and feel something different, then that's what you actually want to achieve. Also, it's like almost also creating a synthetic materiality on the surface. Also, 
also at another level is addressing a different function of the eye because there is also, one can argue that there is a tactile function of vision. So it's a surface that you read rather than uh, just see the totality of it. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, we have more time than one more question. We have more time. I just want to comment uh, on something Mario said, because um, you comment on the way ornament has been produced and is produced now, uh, made a point that it was mostly subtractive processes, that essentially carving, you think of stone most likely. Uh, but uh, let's think of, uh, let's say the last big hooray of ornament was the terracotta architecture phase, Louis Sullivan, happened to look at his work for a little bit, and um, it was not, the process involved essentially, the architect would do the drawing, 2D drawings, and then a sculptor would create a clay model additive process, from which then all the sort of elements for the facade said would be cast, right? So, um, so I'm not saying, so there, there have been other ways, uh, in a way the sort of transition from the craft-based production to the sort of industrial production of architecture is exactly happening at that point. It happened to coincide with the last big flash of ornamentation in architecture. I think there's a lot of interest in Sullivan today. You could probably give a drawing, a kind of set of views of some of your models to one of those folks and you, they would get a pretty good representation uh, physical, they would get a, a physical you know, embodiment of, of your intention. That would be reasonably close, I think, to what a 3D printer could produce. It would be an interesting experiment. Um, it seems, I mean, a lot of the work that we've seen completely hinges on, of course, being able to 3D print, right? Uh, so, what, and, and Pan's work is, is sort of interested in the question of materiality uh, in, in that. It allows us to rethink how we design because we can kind of mix materials sort of on the fly, right? Uh, as we make things. In in, in the case of the Michael and Benjamin's work, the question of materiality seems to be secondary, and it's dominated by the question of geometry and form. Is, is that true, or how could you see question of material coming into your work? How how, would, how do you think would it change the work, or how interested are you in? in material behavior uh, in, in the pursuit of, the, of these amazing forms? We, we indeed left it out entirely as much as we could because we, we were interested on the, uh, in the purely computational aspect and, and in terms of we wanted to retain as much freedom as possible before bringing in the um, material con constraints. Um, as a matter of fact, when we were designing these things, we didn't know how to produce them. Um, it's, it's an interesting question because, of course, there, um, the, the material constraints do come in, um, uh, particularly e even geometric constraints. We're, we're designing with surfaces, and at some point we have to turn them into, into volumes. Um, but, of course, material constraints in terms of structural performance, making sure the thing doesn't collapse, um, and, and, and so on, um, which goes back to a, a visual and haptic perception where, where, where the material plays. A big role. The the feedback loops that we had from the, the moment we set were set on the material to how it altered the form were quite crude at this moment. And I think that's where there is actually um, a lot of potential. Um, that is something that that I think um, I think we, we we want to explore um, is is just to see okay what what happens if if we can get more information from this material and and, and feed it back in how will that influence the design how how could it make it look different. The uh, question of material entered uh, the, the discussion about the project when we found out that it's like 12, uh, this uh, room was 12 tons heavy. So then we had to really start to think about, but as Michael said, a little bit late, maybe how to... How to, how to get uh, it there. Yeah, get yeah. it there. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to frame this well, but like, like by the laws of nature, like um, every material, after time passes, um, entropy increases, things degrade. Um, with this digital and data, things don't degrade, right? But then once you print it out as physical material, it degrades. So is there an effort to make those materials somehow reverse and decrease in entropy and somehow 
yeah, act as if uh, it, yeah, time's not passing or whatever. So overcome kind of that, that physical limitation. I don't know if I'm framing it yeah, correctly. No, I, I understand yeah. your question. We're, yeah. we're not, I guess the question, as I understand, is are we modeling the, the material behavior also, or the way exactly, that we believe the Exactly, because it changes material. once it of gets course, created. Of course, of right? course. And the honest truth is we know nothing about how this material will perform, <laughs> um, or, or, or whether it will even be standing. I mean, it's a, it's a very good question because we don't know whether this thing is going to be standing five years from now or something, or whether all the binder will, will, will collapse. And I think that's all the more true right now for some of these multi-materials. It, it brings, I mean, it, it also ties into this question of um, what, what some people are looking at, um, printing with biological materials that, that, that are meant to be changed, that are meant to um, behave or perform. At the same time, the company also assured us, like, if there would be, like, a, one of the segments break or if there would be a problem, then we can just print it again. That's what they said. So that's also interesting that, like, reproducing it again would be very easy, actually. As a matter of fact, the company, the, the, the thing that they envisioned, the first architectural application they envisioned was simply to, if, if there's a church where something is broken off, you, you, you scan it and reprint it. This is how they imagine their technology. In terms of where, there is also the question of the separation between a material and the material system, because the material system comes also with most of the, mater of the material systems we have now, 100 years of research and trial, so we know how they behave. Predictability is a very important aspect of the material system in order to be used in real-world, full-scale applications. So it's not just about the material, the type of the material, but is understood as the material as a material system. We have more questions? Thank you. Uh, with respect to your last comment, do you think we need another step to go and dis define a language to talk about that behavior? Uh, not just the materialization of all the things we learn from this recognitions or this uh, algorithmic understandings, but some some sort of language that we can learn and discuss about the possibilities of how to, not what to. I'm, I, I'm, I hope I'm clear. <laughs> Definitely a new, a new technology will bring with it a new vocabulary and ultimately a new way of thinking. Uh, and my understanding is also that because we are increasingly rely on software tools to access all these models and information, software tools, I, I don't see them as much as tools as environments. So they already come with the language, the little icons that you click and so on, they're a discretization of actions basically. So they're already imposing a language on you when you use them. And then the debate is who designs these tools, these environments. Uh, do you want to say anything, Michael, about this language? Because I, I really liked your way of questioning the mesh mining mm -hmm. and extracting information and remodeling it. So. Uh, I think it has a lot of potentials. What do you think about it? Well, what's, what's attractive to me about it is that perhaps it, 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 perhaps it creates a language, but perhaps it also defies a language um, in, this, in the sense that it, it, it's so open-ended that if somebody else is using it, somebody else with a different set of references or ideals or different education or something will, will come up with something um, and entirely, almost entirely different. And then the interesting thing is really then f comparing and contrasting where do the similarities li lay, where, where, are, where are the differences. Perhaps that can give us some idea to what, what this language is. It's, it's not going to be produced by one person or a few people creating forms, but by really comparing very, very many instances of, of, of people using a similar methodology, but with completely different preferences and frames of reference and, and so on. Thanks. Hi, thanks. Um, 
really enjoyed your um, all of your presentations. Um, I had a question for all, I guess, more like an open question. Um, and starting with a remark you said, Michael, about um, the notion of control, which was super interesting when you mentioned that you were proposing something beyond parametric design, where parametric was some sort of um, like ways of controlling the design, and you were offering another um, horizon in a way. And I, in my research, I, I look really about this notion of control, because who has the control in the end? I imagine that even in the Digital Grotesque project, you set, set up some rules and constraints for those figures to emerge. Um, and I wonder at this point, where is, so the, like, what's the tension between the role of the designer and the, the implication of the data and also with the sort of numerous source of where the data can come from, how do we let it free and how do we sort of constrain it in a way? And you can all answer as well. Yeah, I think in, the, in this design process, it's um, as Michael mentioned, it's a de deterministic, it's a deterministic design process. So we can repeat the same thing with the same settings again. But what was very important is the moment of surprise. So you you have to actually uh, uh, run the software, uh, um, um, export it, render it, which takes sometimes like two hours or three hours, in order to evaluate the design. But you really don't know. It's like beyond your imagination. I think that was the the great thing about designing with these tools that we could we could create something that we could not imagine. We could actually at the end we could materialize something that we could not render even. And still, there's uh, of course there was the need for constraining the design in terms of developing, developing and imagining. It was like a constant uh, feedback loop between adding constraints and being surprised by new new uh, options that actually the computer proposed. Yeah. Well, anything that is implemented in software is, in a sense, deterministic. So there is a closed uh, space of possibilities there, already embedded in the way you encode something. Uh, there is procedural parts in the code. So, in a sense, uh, the fact, though, that you understand the components, the fact that you understand the parts that make up this procedure, doesn't mean that you can predict the outcomes. So the disconnect between outcomes and parts uh, is what gives rise, rise uh, surprises and interesting. I, I also think in that perspective that uh, what I often at least try to do uh, as a designer is also to not foresee necessarily the uses and the misuses and the reappropriations of the users. So for instance, when you were like saying that they wanted to touch um, the artifacts or that there is this idea where you can set as many deterministic constraints as, as you think you are, but in the end you can also, I think, try and maybe you would agree or disagree, try to sort of open the part where the user comes in and kind of use whatever installation or experience or that you've set in a completely un unanticipated, surprising way. Have you? But that's not specific to digital media. That applies to everything, even in the most massive, mass-produced industrial artifact, right? Yeah. So. But, but it is an interesting point. I mean, you say we, we speak about the surprise in the design, but the, the, the surprise to us Extends and, and how some of these and how some of these things are are perceived, which which is which we were surprised by the range of um, reactions, which indeed range from very aggressive to, to other people who um, don't 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 seem to mind that much. I think we will have a clear idea when these things stop being a novelty, because when something is a novelty, it already draws both negative and positive, but certainly strong interest, but when it becomes more ubiquitous, we could have a better understanding about how the average user will go in habit with these uh, artifacts. But in terms of ubiquity, I want to stress it's well, like what, what we've shown today is, is, is one possibility. It's, it's not exclusive, it's not comprehensive, it's one possible tiny fragment that might showcase 
some some of the potentials, but it's it's by no means by no means comprehensive or, or, or exclusive. So I'm not so in terms of ubiquity, I'm I'm not even sure what it would what it would look like. I think that uh, in current uh, industrialized environments, this level of intricacy and material control is not common. Okay, so you in terms of that. Yeah. So in in a sense, it becomes either attractive or repulsive, but definitely has this uh, effect of eliciting or demanding some reaction. Mm -hmm. We cannot really treat it as background. Right. Intrigued me when I saw the, the ornament that you showed. <laughs> is, uh, I was puzzling about the statue of this sculpture uh, itself, because what it freezes in time has a lot to do with the perceptual mechanisms by which we actually make sense of the spaces around ourself, ourselves. So I was just wondering if you, if you, I could see an object like this at the Exploratorium Science Museum, you know, the Museum of Art, Science, and, hu and Human Perception, and I see its own status as something like the Eames chamber that was constructed by the scientists to show the illusion of pers uh, perspective. I don't know if you have been in there. So I think this object that you created has a statue that itself transcends architecture. It's not a laboratory instrumentation either. And I was just wondering if you had thought about the, the, the statues of this object itself. I think you caught us off guard. No, <laughs> we haven't. Um, no. But I mean, what, what really our experience was that, that uh, it's like a projection surface also. What people see in this object is always different. And in that sense, it definitely could be like a, a part of a, a, a could be part of a uh, perceptual uh, experiment, but but it was not the uh, original intention, actually. Yeah. yeah, there was there was an exhibit at the exploratorium that was called Geometry of Playground. Okay. They played with shapes like this, and they, they, they actually even built small instances of them, big instances of them, just to have people explore these questions of scale, these questions of point of view, this, this question of an allocentric versus egocentric point of view, depending on how you enter in the materials and so on. And what was nice, at least to me, in seeing your object, is that it's a universe in which all these scales exist at the same time. And in a, in a way, as, as a person who perceives this object, you project yourself in if you want. So you become tiny and you, and you, and you begin to realize this multi-scale uh, quality of it. Or you pull yourself out and you, you, you adopt this God eyes, the God's eyes view. Yeah, that, I mean, that I think, we didn't speak today very much about design and tension. We, we, we spoke today a lot about loss of control, which, which I think maybe was over overemphasized because there was actually quite a bit of design and tension. And it, and it was um, largely about, about yeah, creating a space that you can only understand as you move through it or that will reveal itself more as you go through it. So if you move into it and, and suddenly look up to the left, you might see something very small that, that you, you weren't able to um, to perceive before. The, the possibility of multiple moments, um, which are subjective, I guess, which depend on the light, the illumination um, played, played a big role, um, and which we hope will only increase the, the, the possibilities of, or the potential of it once, once this multimateriality becomes more affordable at a, at a larger scale. Maybe also in terms of order, like the, the, the one, when we look at it, it's not like white noise, so it's not purely random, but it's also not strictly symmetric everywhere. And it's interesting that uh, people start to, to try to deduce the system behind, and it somehow looks organic, but it's not so, so easy to find out. It's A lot of uh, digital design artifacts have this property of uh, ambiguity. 
embedded in them. Also because the materials we tend to use are materials that don't have any grain, so we lose all scale reference when we actually encounter these objects. The sand is quite grainy, though. It's, it's, yeah, but you don't it's have, too grainy. I wish have, we could get a smooth You don't have a surface. reference of what this material would be in its natural state, right? You haven't experienced it in its pure form. It's not like a piece of wood that you understand that the grain approximately corresponds to a millimeter. Right, right, right. Yeah, that, it reminds me very much of this this quote that Benjamin and I often often return to. It's by Louis Kahn, Louis Kahn who said to his students, um, "You you have a brick, and and brick um, the brick says to you, um, you ask the brick what do you want to be. The brick says, I." I want to be an arch, and then you say to the brick, "No, it's too expensive for you to be an arch. I can make a, some some sort of concrete beam over the opening." And the brick says, "I I want to be an arch." And 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 the question maybe we have to ask ourselves is, what would this grain of sand like to, like to become? We still don't know yet what what it could become or what its its its, its materiality is or how it should express itself. Have more questions? Maybe I will just jump um, go back to one thing that was uh, brought and not discussed in too much detail, and it relates with the idea of uh, abundance and scarcity. And um, Pan was saying um, a computation is a scarce resource, and um, we seem to be um, moving within the notion that um, computation and um, resolution can be infinite. I mean, we have completely abundance. And this is uh, very evident when, when we see your work. It, uh, it goes to the maximum level. But in computer science, uh, there is also an encryption. There is always trying to test what's, what is actually possible. There is a, a fixed limit to how much it can be computed. And uh, using all the atoms in the world and all the time in the, in the world, there is a limit. So. Are we, are we still, are we, do we need to start thinking about those limits or we are really that far away? And how will you see that in your, in your work with computation? Well, it uh, definitely manifests itself. It's any time you have to do any physical simulation. There, but the fact that computation is a limited resource and it might take a year to simulate a drop of liquid versus to actually drop a drop of liquid those the limits of what is possible right now. There's yeah, I mean there there's 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 many limits. And um, I, I remember working at ETH and I was saying, ah, can't can't you get us a new computer, a more powerful computer, then we don't have to wait so much longer. And and the person said, No, no way, because with a more powerful computer you'll just do something more complex and you'll wait just as long as before. <laughs> um, and it's true. We spend we spend a lot of a lot of time waiting, uh, a lot of time for for these calculations to um, compute, to to produce variance, and so on. But I think there's still something something that that, that that's very very different um, than than the way that we um, used computers even 10, 15, 20 years ago when they were tools for productivity enhancement, where we were essentially replicating what we were doing in. In, with with a pen or um, with a mouse drawing lines or so on or maybe determining points of a spline and, and what we're doing today and that has been made possible by these, um, by these um, more endless resources in, in terms of combinations calculations um, systems of relationships I would also argue in the opposite direction because if you see the history of computer games I see a lot more innovation in terms of the visual impact and uh, interaction in early games that had only you know 16 kilobytes of memory, the absolute nothing, and they had to fit code, graphics, and everything. And an extreme economy of expression. And, uh, People and return to it today, no? Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's a very masterpiece. The of constraint was yeah. causing innovation. Was uh, a very interesting period. I, I prefer almost that uh, period than the current period of video games. It's interesting that people seem to be returning to these constraints. I mean, some people, they're, they're putting these constraints upon themselves even though they're not there. Part of design as a discipline is making constraints. <laughs> <laughs> so any last question?
So let's thank you, the panelists. It has been a very great presentation and discussion. <laughs>